order members order it's time for questions of the office of first minister and deputy first minister and we will start with all questions first can i alert the house question number six and 14 has been withdrawn and i call robin swan mr swan question number one mr speaker thank you mr speaker none <laughs> Thank the First Minister for his brief answer. Can I ask him then, with regard to the Colliers Market Research for the Peace Centre, a document that the Minister has quoted favourably in the House in the past, what's his opinion in the section that makes clear that the Education and Training Inspectorate think the Peace Centre, including the Mayes Prison Hospital, would be an ideal place for six-year-olds to visit as part of their personal development and mutual understanding section of Key Stage 1 of the revised curriculum? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, neither the Deputy First Minister or I had uh, any conversation with Colliers. Uh, they, I think, based it largely on the Ulster Unionist-led master plan, uh, which, re which refers directly to the involvement of children uh, and young people in a centre which the Ulster Unionist Party endorsed as being within the listed building. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much, and I thank the First Minister for his answer so far. Uh, would the First Minister recognise that a balanced narrative around such a centre at this location would be a powerful tool to educate young people about the errors and indeed the horrors of the past and would contribute to peace and reconciliation in the future? Well, leaving aside the issue of the, the peace centre, uh, as part of our together building a united community. It's essential that there is education, and that education should be in the, the schools uh, about our past, uh, indicating the folly of terrorism, uh, the impact that it has on the lives of tens of thousands of, of people, uh, and the need to support democratic institutions and the democratic way forward. Mr. Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for his answers so far, and can I ask the First Minister, in relation uh, to the uh, centre, the Peace Centre, whenever the UUP uh, was leading the group on Mays Long Cash, uh, was it not in their proposal that the Peace Centre uh, and the listed buildings would be part and parcel of, of, of uh, one building? Uh, and did they not at that time, as you have alluded to earlier, propose that uh, young people could use that uh, as a centre uh, uh, in the future? Well, th this is part of the revisionism, Mr. Speaker, that the Ulster Unionist Party have been uh, engaging in. Uh, it was they that uh, chaired the group that brought forward the master plan. It was their leader who publicly endorsed that master plan. Yeah. That master plan had at its heart having the peace, having the peace centre, having the peace centre within the cartilage of the listed buildings. Uh, it also indicated that uh, the uh, listed buildings would be used as part of uh, a tour. Uh, it also indicated that there should be educational elements within it. So it ill becomes uh, any of them to take a report that was not asked for by the Deputy First Minister or myself, which was not approved by us after it was uh, conducted, uh, and then try and indicate by way of smear that somehow this was the thinking uh, of OFM DFM. Raymond McCartney, Raymond McCartney, order uh, members, order. I got a member to come through those going Vegas, less than pre Nefragrishan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I kind of thank the First Minister for his answers to date, be it the, the first draft of the first master plan or the most recent draft. Uh, right consistently throughout this, the unique selling point was from conflict to peace to prosperity. Does the First Minister agree that without that as a unique selling point, then the ability to promote and market the rest of the site is severely undermined? Well, I think there are very few of us, uh, if we go to the west coast of the United States, wouldn't uh, go to Alcatraz. There are very few of us uh, who haven't been to one of the facilities that was used by the, the Nazis. All, all of those have an historic uh, content uh, to them. Uh, in the context uh, of Northern Ireland, it is absolutely vital if you're going to have a peace centre, the peace centre itself doesn't become a cause of division. Uh, and that's why it was always judged by us that it was essential that if we are to have a facility, it is a facility that has broad support from both sections of our community and particularly from the victims of our troubles. Mervyn Story. Mr. Story. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, with uh, your permission, I'll answer questions two and nine together. A key focus of the Executive's programme for Government 2011 to 2015 is to grow the economy. We are committed to bringing investment, jobs, tourists, new skills, and best practice into Northern Ireland by promoting local skills and developing mutually beneficial relationships with targeted countries, regions, and international organisations. Securing international projects requires long-term relationship building and raising awareness of the many advantages of investing in Northern Ireland. We will continue to be proactive in targeting countries and organisations in an effort to secure trade and investment opportunities. The Executive's International Relations Strategy complements and coordinates the work of government departments, agencies and other organisations. It also builds on the significant international relations activity in recent years associated with our successful hosting of the G8 Summit, the World Police and Fire Games, the MTV Europe Music Awards, the UK City of Culture, the Global India Conference, the Irish Open and most recently the hugely successful Giro d'Italia. Already our international engagement during the last year has generated a number of significant benefits. Mr. Speaker, I make no apology for our commitment to promote economic growth in Northern Ireland and for devoting so much of our time, both at home and on our international visits, to meeting with potential investors. This strategy has proved hugely successful and we remain confident that it will continue to produce positive dividends in the years to come. Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the uh, First Minister for uh, his answer? And could the First Minister, on the back of the success of the international engagement, could the First Minister comment, particularly in relation to the announcement last week by Invest Northern Ireland, of their performance for the last financial year and the contribution that they have made to securing the prosperity of this particular sector? Yes, I, I, I'm grateful that the member gives me an opportunity to congratulate Invest Northern Ireland and its Chief Executive Alistair Hamilton uh, on the successes they have. Uh, the problem for uh, Invest Northern Ireland is that uh, once they raise the, the bar, then and never we're looking at targets for future years, uh, they go up as, as well. But I, I did note that uh, in the uh, Northern Ireland performance of Invest, uh, it indicated that uh, they had brought in a total uh, of new jobs, 10,800, which is up 49% on last year. Uh, local jobs, 6,040, that's up 34% on last year. External jobs, 4,760, up 75% on last year. 73% of the rebalancing jobs, incidentally, were above the private sector median uh, salary. They brought in one. 0.09 billion of investment. That is up 83% on last year. That brings in total wages and salaries of £190 million, uh, 5,249 offers of support. 94% of those, incidentally, were for local businesses, uh, and 2,995 businesses have been supported. That's up 15%. And I suppose particularly for those of us who are looking at the programme for government, where we set them four-year targets, on a number of those categories, after three years, they have already exceeded their four-year target. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. Can the Minister indicate when he anticipates that the Executive will be in a position to open an office in Beijing? The uh, Deputy First Minister and I are presently scheduled, uh, I think, to, to be in China in November for the opening of that office, if everything goes to to plan. Uh, again, that's hugely significant. I think those of us who were around uh, the uh, Balmoral show over the last week uh, will have heard from a, a number of the uh, farmers and producers the importance of getting uh, our produ produce out to, to China and the massive change that that could make uh, to business here in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think uh, a presence uh, in Beijing would be important. It's a political capital uh, of uh, China. The Chinese uh, we have met on several uh, occasions, uh, Madam Liu Yandong coming to Northern Ireland, our meeting with her when we went to, to China, all indicating that uh, from a government perspective they are very keen uh, and supportive of helping Northern Ireland and working with us. So uh, I hope that the opening of that uh, new office will give us a, a strong base from which we can grow our economy here. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Could I ask the Minister what work is being done collaboratively with the universities here to ensure that whenever you are making your, your uh, trips abroad, uh, particularly with a view to attracting FDI, that there are tailor-made packages and work being done with the universities to ensure that we boost the opportunities for our graduates from those universities? Yeah, well, I, I can assure them that uh, we have the, the best relationship with the universities. Uh, it's led largely by Stephen Farry at uh, Dell, uh, and that's an integral part of the, the package when we are negotiating. Uh, if we know how many jobs that they're going to bring to Northern Ireland and what skills are required, then the Assured Skills Project ensures that we have those skills uh, available when they come. The universities, of course, uh, haven't just been helpful in terms of making sure that we have people with the necessary skills. They've also been very supportive in terms of research and development. Uh, and uh, I think quite uniquely in Northern Ireland, we have uh, the three-pronged uh, approach, uh, where people uh, who are in business can have a good relationship with the universities. They can have a good relationship with government. Uh, and business as a central part uh, works with them as well. So, all of that is part of the, the package that we encourage people to come to Northern Ireland on the basis that we have the skills in Northern Ireland, we can produce the people when they need them. Phil Flanagan, Mr Flanagan. I, I agree with the First Minister about the excellent performance of Invest and I in, in actually delivering on the numbers of jobs it has not only promoted but actually created. But in terms of the programme for government commitment um, to deal with um, disadvantage, not only growing the economy, but actually tackling disadvantage. Can I ask the First Minister whether he would support a stipulation on, on Invest and I that all jobs created through Invest and I or with grant funding should be paid at the living wage? Well, of course we are covered by United Kingdom uh, legislation in terms of the minimum wage. Uh, I would very much encourage uh, companies that are coming to Northern Ireland uh, to be coming, offering jobs with high salaries. I already indicated uh, that uh, three quarters of those who are coming to, to Northern Ireland are providing us with jobs which are above the private sector median. Uh, so those are the better paid uh, jobs. Uh, of course, we also have uh, jobs created within our own economy here in Northern Ireland with indigenous companies. Uh, and of course, the, the more productive companies are, the more they can pay uh, in terms of uh, salaries. And I think it's a a virtuous circle because uh, the, the more staff are paid, the harder they, they will work and the more commitment they will give to a company. Mr Speaker, uh, I'll ask my colleague, uh, Junior Minister Jonathan Bell, to answer this question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Delivering social change aims to deliver a sustained reduction in poverty and associated issues across all age groups and an improvement in children and young people's health, their well-being and their life opportunities. Clearly, delivering social change is not something the executive can deliver on its own. We recognise that it is going to involve a partnership approach to help make change happen. Our department hosted stakeholder engagement events in June and in October 2012, with participation from children's sector organisations. These events led to the development of the Children and Young Persons Early Action Paper, identifying key priorities to be taken forward, and these informed the signature programmes. Another stakeholder engagement event was held in June 2013. This January, we launched a consultation document delivering social change for children and young people, building on the work commissioned from the National Children's Bureau on an outcomes framework which sets out a partnership approach to tackling child poverty and improving outcomes for children and for young people. We held six public consultation events, some of which were hosted by the children's sector, including Action for Children in Ballymena and the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership in Armagh, as well as numerous consultative events with stakeholders such as Bernardo's Six Sense Group the Child Poverty Alliance and the Rural Community Network. A new strategy will be led in the Assembly shortly, which will set out a framework to include ongoing engagement with the children's sector 
and roles for the Commissioner for Children and Young People and Children's Sector Organisation in the further development, delivery and, of course, the monitoring of this work. Oliver McMillan. Can I thank the Junior Minister for his comprehensive answer so far? Does, does he accept that the Children and Young People's uh, Strategic Partnership has been working within an indicator framework for quite some time now? And can he give assurances this will be part of any future delivery within delivering social change? Of course, we're always looking uh, towards the indicators, but what I like particularly about the outcomes model is we're measuring ourselves against, what, uh, against results. Um, we know what the evidence base is, is, and the Children's Strategic Partnership has given us the knowledge base, the evidence to inform us uh, what we need to do. But I think it's important in OFM, DFM, that we measure ourselves against the results that we actually achieve. And that's why I find the outcomes approach uh, the most effective, because it's saying, look, look at the evidence, take best practice, and then consider the outcomes that are achieved for that. And as we monitor, we'll refine and review those outcomes uh, as we go along. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Junior Minister for his answer. Could the Junior Minister indicate what advances have been achieved in equipping children with the best educational start in life? Well, of course, if uh, a child has the best educational start in life, they can not only lift themselves uh, out of poverty, but uh, they can often have a significant impact uh, on their family. Uh, the key part of that is literacy and numeracy. Um, and we did target specifically young people uh, who were experiencing difficulty falling just below the mark in literacy and numeracy. And as a result of a programme in literacy and numeracy, over 223 teachers are now in post providing additional teaching. Okay? That's additional teaching, support to those children and young people who are most at risk at underachieving in English and maths at critical stages of their education. The Signature Programme is also providing recently graduated teachers with valuable experience. 125 primary schools and 142 post-primary schools are benefiting from this programme. 61 controlled primary schools, 52 controlled post-primary schools are benefiting uh, specifically. But schools, this is the encouraging part, are already beginning to see a positive impact from this initiative. They're seeing increased pupil confidence, they're seeing uh, pupils progressing and improving, and it's already evident within that specific target group. And the most encouraging thing I've found is that an increase in scores of sample questions and attainment of a grade C in MAS in the January 2014 examination showed progress uh, and improvement. So the additional teaching, the additional input is working and we hope that flows through uh, to the actual exams later <coughs> stages in their lives. Fergal McKinney. Mr McKinney. Thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, he's, he's outlined about monitoring and measuring. Can he detail how delivering social change will help early years intervention in socially deprived areas? Well, of course, one of the most critical areas in socially uh, deprived areas is in the issue of childcare. Um, many families are saying to us, and said to us in the past before we put the Bright Start programme in place, and I know there's a question later on, so I'll, I'll not uh, give the full uh, answer to that. But the big difficulty, particularly for people re-entering the workforce, young women re-entering the workforce, was the cost uh, of childcare. And we know that when we get childcare right, and we put it to an appropriate standard, as evidenced by the, the professionals in the field, such as the Early Years uh, Partnership, we know that when we, that, that young person uh, develops their skills uh, and also we know that the, the family are free, but the difficulty was that childcare had to be flexible and that childcare had to be affordable. I mean, if you're starting out with a £500 bill to clear for childcare for a month, it just ruined many people's prospects of re-entering the labour market. Uh, so we set out a programme to make it flexible uh, because ours change, and particularly people re-entering the, the, the labour market, particularly young women re-entering the labour market, um, are on flexible contracts and flexible hours, so the childcare therefore has to be flexible. Uh, and uh, secondly, it had to be affordable. 
And so we used a social enterprise model, which is incredibly exciting. But this wasn't just minding children to allow people to go out. We evidenced it against the standards of good practice that are already in place so that the child gets a wonderful opportunity themselves in terms of their childcare. That childcare is delivering in terms of their relationship skills, their educational skills, their socialization skills, and in many cases, it's given those children a hand up into their educational performance. Roy Banks. Yes, sir. Speaker. The Northern Ireland Children and Young People's Commissioner is tasked with looking after the interests of our children and young people in particular, and particularly the most vulnerable. Can the junior minister advise how the OFM, DFM have actively engaged with the Northern Ireland Children's Commissioner in terms of designing the draft strategy and consultation plan? I, I, I can't recall just how many meetings both Junior Minister and McCann and I have had uh, in, our, in the recent period. There's at least three uh, that spring to mind. Um, and the Children's Commissioner operates, as she should do, as a critical friend. But we have looked at all of the issues, uh, and including the, the last stage of the consultation uh, event, both Junior, junior Minister McCann and I attended that, where the Speaker was uh, the Children's Commissioner, but both uh, formally and informally in private meetings in our offices, we've had constructive engagement uh, with the Northern Ireland Children's Commissioner. We've used that evidence base uh, that they have. We've talked to their researchers. We've talked to each of their heads of office uh, in each of their particular fields. And as a result of that, uh, as I said in literacy and numeracy, we are already seeing results, positive results, where children are attaining where previously they had not. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Question four, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Executive's International Relations Strategy provides the opportunity to coordinate international work across departments, their agencies, and with other organizations. This includes identifying opportunities for events that promote a positive image of Northern Ireland internationally and to take forward ideas generated from our discussions with visiting international representatives. This work has included Northern Ireland hosting a number of significant and hugely successful sporting, music and cultural events and secured high-level visits from international leaders, including the G8 Summit, a visit from the Chinese Vice Premier, Madame Liu Yandong, Prime Minister Abe of Japan and the former Prime Minister of Libya. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to highlight the incredible success of the Giro d'Italia when everyone in Northern Ireland embraced the excitement and spectacle of the event uh, and we're very active participants. Uh, all those involved in bringing the Giro d'Italia to Northern Ireland and those who selflessly volunteered throughout the route uh, on occasions in the face of some inclement Northern Ireland weather should be justifiably proud of what they achieved. As an executive, we acknowledge that collectively we need to build on this success and as ministers with specific responsibility for international relations, the Deputy First Minister and I will refocus our efforts to bring more successful events and positive international activities to Northern Ireland in the future. I am confident that we can build on the legacy of the Giro and continue to establish Northern Ireland as a venue capable of successfully hosting world-class events. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for, for that response. And the First Minister has uh, referred to the re recent success of the Giro d'Italia that uh, brought such great promotion to Northern Ireland. Can I ask the, the First Minister for his comments on the possibility of bringing other major events to Northern Ireland, such as the Tour de France and the Open. Thank you. Well, there, there are a lot. Of, without going into the specific uh, events, uh, there, there is work in progress on a number of key uh, events, uh, and we are very keen to, to bring them to Northern Ireland. As I indicated, the, the people of Northern Ireland, if you provide a quality uh, event for them, they turn out. Uh, and I, I have to say that I was pleased when we looked at the Irish Open. Uh, in Port Rush, uh, in spite again of uh, having Northern Ireland style weather, that we produced the largest uh, attendance uh, of any event on the European tour. Uh, and again, uh, I'm sure many of you have watched the, the further uh, legs of the Giro d'Italia uh, as it has gone back to, to, to Italy. And again, the best turnout that uh, the Giro uh, d'Italia has had thus far has been in Northern Ireland. Yeah. John Dallet. Mr. Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also thank the, the Minister uh, for his answer, and I'm sure he would agree 
that one of the most successful international events has just finished in uh, the triangle area of Coleraine. Sadly, uh, Speaker, two riders are fighting for their lives in the Royal Victoria Hospital, Simon Andrews and Frank Petricola. Would the Minister uh, consider engaging with the Minister for Regional Development and see how uh, safety could be improved on this course to ensure the longevity of this very important event? Well, I agree with the, the member uh, that the North West 200 has uh, played a very significant role in attracting visitors to Northern Ireland and providing a real spectacle uh, for, for local people. Uh, I can say to him that uh, I'm ahead of him because uh, the Minister for Regional Development and I were both up at the, the North West uh, 200 uh, on Saturday. Uh, we have had some discussions uh, with the organisers as well. Uh, for them, the issue of safety is a continual one. Uh, they had some new features, indeed uh, some of those features, the curb protectors, uh, were of a significant help when it came to the, the first accident that uh, occurred there. If they hadn't been there, it would have been many times uh, worse. Uh, so it must be an ongoing process of making sure that the race is as safe as it possibly uh, can be. Uh, I have to say that uh, having been there, uh, the, the speeds are... Uh, more than uh, I could endure, I, I couldn't cycle that fast, uh, but uh, it, it was something that the public, even in the rain, were filling the, the stands and the route, uh, and the organizers were, organizers were indicating that there were crowds standing in areas which they had never, been stu that had never stood in before. So they really expected it to be a larger turnout than previous years, uh, and Korean Council, of course, plays a very significant role uh, in the, the preparation and uh, organisation of, of that event. Danny Kennehan. Thank you very Kenahan. much, Mr Speaker, and if I can be specific, um, would the First Minister support Barry McGuigan if he's sought to support bringing Carl Frampton's fight here to Belfast? Yes, well, again, I've met both Barry McGuigan and Carl Frampton, uh, and uh, I, I very much support uh, the, his ability to, to bring uh, events to, to Northern Ireland. Uh, I see Carl Frampton uh, as a future world champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when he gets into that position, he'll be able to dictate where his events uh, are going to be. At this stage, it is a matter of negotiation, and uh, any support or influence that any of us has uh, to, to assist uh, Barry McGuigan in bringing it to, to Northern Ireland, you can be absolutely certain there will be a very strong support uh, from the, the, the local boxing community for such a, an event. Judith Cotton. Question number five, please. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. Uh, the member is referring to the £12 million to support the development of the childcare strategy. I'm pleased that last year we published the Bright Start strategic framework and its 15 key first actions. These actions will not only fully utilise the £12 million, but we are, in fact, projected to spend £15 to £17 million. We have already received high levels of interest and applications to the grant scheme. The full Bright Start childcare strategy is under active development with a view to publication in March uh, 2015. The 15 key first actions launched in September last year are intended to support and to inform this process of development. The most ambitious of the key first actions aim to create or sustain up to 7,000 school-age childcare places. Because some evidence is suggesting that there is sort of not the three or a one in three chance of, uh, or one in four chance of getting a, a sort of place if you're under three to four years of age. Whereas when you're in the school age, those numbers multiply sometimes up to a one in 19 chance uh, of getting a school-age childcare places. And we have some wonderful schools and some excellent school estates. And I know that even in my own area of Strangford, there is particular interest in developing school-age childcare uh, because of the need that has been identified. And obviously not having to transport children off-site and everything else works for the parent and delivers uh, for the child. But the Bright Start School-Age Childcare Grant Scheme uh, launched in March of this year to deliver these places over the next three and a half years. All your members, that includes all questions to the First Minister. We now move to topical questions uh, to the First Minister. 
and I call Cahill Boyle. Mr. Boyle. Garmagat, can call you, uh, Minister, in light of the recent sectarian racist and hate crime attacks, in particular in East Belfast, could the Minister outline his office's strategy to deal with it and indeed the strategy of the wider executive? Well, can, can I deal with the premise upon which the question is based? The phrase particularly in East Belfast, uh, and that is a, a comment that has been made by the Deputy First Minister and indeed many people in the, the press. Uh, it would appear that uh, their GPS needs to be uh, recalibrated because the official statistics show that uh, the area where most of the racist attacks are occurring is in South Belfast. Uh, after that, it is North Belfast and then East Belfast. Uh, however, uh, I'm sure he will agree with me that no matter whether it's north, south, east or west, Belfast, they are to be deplored. They are to be condemned uh, on every possible uh, occasion. Support needs to be given to those who have been uh, involved, and I encourage people in local communities to continue to give the, the support that they have uh, to people who are attacked, whether it's from a racist attack or whether it's from a sectarian uh, attack. Anyone who has information should be giving that information uh, to the PSNI so that people can be questioned, charged and convicted of those offences, no matter what organisation or whether they are in any organisation or not, including the, the UVF, who the police have indicated were involved in some. Uh, but I do point out that the, the police specifically indicate, uh, and I quote from the PSNI statement, that given the range of motivations for racist hate crime across the city, it is too complex an issue for one-dimensional assessments. Uh, however, all of us in this chamber, I hope, will condemn all of those who are involved in racist uh, attacks. These are people who have come to make a contribution to our society. Many of them are indispensable in terms of the, uh, the work that they carry out. Uh, and, uh, of course, many of them have been our allies, allies in difficult times in the past. Mr. Boyle. I to thank the First Minister for his answer, but could the First Minister indicate whether or not he is going to provide any financial support for any of those groups, those people who have suffered, whether they need re rehoused or anything else? Well, in terms of rehousing, I, I, I trust that uh, we can engage those who are responsible in the Department of Social Development and the Housing Executive on those uh, issues. Uh, I know that the Deputy First Minister and I will do anything that we can to, to give uh, assistance. Uh, we, of course, have uh, been working on the, the uh, strategy dealing with uh, race. It is part of uh, the overall ambit that includes good relations in Northern Ireland. So whether it is through uh, funding, if that is what is uh, required, or whether it is uh, providing an overall strategy, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I will not be found wanting. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the First Minister outline what negotiations are going to take place with the Treasury in relation to the upcoming comprehensive spending review to make sure that the promised peace dividend financial package post-07 is going to be realised? Well, we, we had a, a very strong commitment from the Labour administration uh, about uh, what the prospects would be and the peace dividend that uh, would uh, transpire. Uh, regrettably, uh, over the subsequent uh, years, there has been very significant reduction uh, in the uh, funding available to us. Uh, that is a, as a result, I recognise, of uh, the worldwide recession. Uh, however, it is becoming even more difficult now because uh, much of the funding, while it is remaining the same, is moving more from revenue into capital. Uh, and that means that uh, programmes which were aimed at helping those who are, are most uh, in need uh, have to be readdressed as a result of uh, the, the shortfalls that uh, exist. Uh, the comprehensive spending uh, review, uh, we of course have a, a difficulty in that it uh, spans uh, the, the period and lifetime of this uh, executive, uh, but the finance minister is engaged with the, uh, the Treasury uh, on all of those uh, issues. Uh, I have to say that before we ever get to the comprehensive spending review, the finance minister is scratching his head with difficulties uh, in terms of making our, our budget last. Uh, across the, the existing period, and there are hard decisions that are going to have to be taken by the, the executive uh, to ensure that we live within the, the limits of funds that are available to us. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for his comprehensive answer. 
Would the First Minister, Minister accept, however, that given the legacy of lack of capital investment in infrastructure in the past, that it is incumbent on the Executive jointly to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to make a special case to make sure that some of the capital projects, including the A5, do not fall off the table? The, the amount of capital expenditure has increased to 1.6 billion. I think it needs to be said at the, the same time that, uh, in relation to capital expenditure, uh, when we came in as a devolved institution, we almost doubled the amount of uh, capital expenditure uh, from when direct rule had been uh, res responsible. Uh, as far as the, uh, the A5 uh, is concerned, uh, that was not a matter that related to uh, our ability uh, in terms of providing the, the funds. Uh, we had uh, assigned the funds for that project. Uh, the project in the first instance was held back because the government of the Irish Republic was unable to meet the commitment that they had made to us uh, to, uh, to pay for effectively half uh, of the, the road. That meant that we had to readdress uh, how we would use our, our funds. We agreed the parts of the road that we would go ahead with and then got tied up uh, in legal issues uh, arising from uh, a judicial uh, review. Uh, the executive is still committed uh, to that uh, scheme, but we're left very much in the hands of uh, DRD being able to get the, the, the necessary approvals through. Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week in OFM DFM questions, uh, the Deputy First Minister attacked unionist leaders for not denouncing racist attacks in East Belfast. Would the party leader and the First Minister like to outline what actions were actually taken amongst unionism at that time and what his views are on these issues? Well, I, I think uh, unionist leaders, and I just don't talk about my own party because it's the same position as far as uh, other unionist leaders are concerned, uh, they have all opposed uh, racist uh, attacks and uh, will continue to, to do so. Uh, I've already indicated that there has been something of an attempt to, to demonise East Belfast by indicating that it's somehow the, the hotbed of racist uh, attacks when actually South Belfast and North Belfast uh, have uh, worse, worse figures both in terms of crimes and instances of uh, racist uh, attacks. Uh, however, it does give me the opportunity once again uh, to condemn all of those who are involved in such uh, attacks. They are not representative uh, of our community in Northern Ireland. We are a welcoming place. We encourage people from uh, other areas to, to come here uh, and to contribute uh, and build up uh, our uh, economy. Uh, I would also say that uh, in terms of uh, the, the PSNI, uh, we give full support to the PSNI uh, in dealing with this uh, issue, and people should give information if they do have it available. Craig. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank the First Minister for that answer. We were, uh, unionist leaders were also accused, accused of cardists of the worst kind around this issue. Would the First Minister not only outline his thoughts on that, but he would also ask all members of this House to condemn attacks on Orange Hall, such as Four Score, which took place this week? Uh, and on the latter point, uh, I, I'm sure they will all do so and uh, do so very willingly. Uh, as far as the, the attack on, on unionist leaders is concerned, uh, I don't think that the member need concern himself too much. I, I think it was a, a synthetic attack. Uh, it was uh, an attempt to deflect attention away uh, from uh, the conditional support that the Deputy First Minister had indicated to the PSNI uh, and indeed on the focus that there had been uh, in terms of uh, the terrorist past of uh, those involved in Sinn Féin. However, I will tell him what I do believe to be uh, cardice of the worst kind, uh, and that's uh, those who shoot people in the, the back and have done so in the past. Here, it's here. the cardice of those who strap individuals to uh, a, a vehicle and then put a bomb in it. It's the cardice of those who take out uh, a, a young woman from the midst of her family with uh, a widow with ten children take her away and torture her, tie her hands behind her, her back and then shoot her in the back of the, the head. That's cardice of the, the worst yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah, so there, there is a, a, a order, definition order that, that order. is re required. Now, I, I wonder, uh, amongst the smiles that we're getting on the, the other side, uh, are there any that are prepared to put up their hand and indicate that the IRA has been involved in cardice of the worst kind? 
Not one, uh, Mr. Speaker. Not one would say that uh, those who tied a bomb uh, to the window of the Le Mans Hotel uh, and then had a, a napalm style effect uh, on those who had gone to enjoy a, a dinner uh, for the Collie Club. That is cardice of the worst kind. Those who plant a bomb at a remembrance service in Enniskillen, that's cardice of the worst kind. Those who would stop uh, a vehicle uh, with uh, workmen returning home at King's Mills, that's uh, cardice uh, of the worst kind. So I'll not take lectures from anybody on the issue of cardice. Yeah. Order, order, Oliver McMullen. He's going to say something. Will the Minister agree with me that the television pictures of the coastal villages of Glenarm, Carnock, Waterfoot and my own village of Cushendall during the period of Italia that were being worldwide has now shown the, the, the massive tourist potential of the Antrim Coast Road? I, I thought it was a fantastic spectacle and uh, uh, for me the horses riding along the, the, the beach while the cyclists were uh, in parallel on the, the road, uh, were uh, absolutely fantastic and the, the kind of image that we want to have uh, of Northern Ireland. I have no doubt that the Northern Ireland Tourist Board uh, and Tourism Ireland will want to use many of the, the scenes uh, from the Giro d'Italia, particularly the helicopter shots, which I think showed our countryside uh, in uh, its splendour. Uh, I, of course, uh, go to the North Coast on many occasions. Uh, I cycle up some of the elements of the, uh, not the uh, tour head, I have to say, uh, but many of the parts of the, the North Coast. Uh, it is an excellent part of Northern Ireland uh, and uh, a real attractor uh, for those who are wanting to come to, to Northern Ireland uh, as visitors. Oliver McMullen, Mr. McMullen, order members. I thank the First Minister for those encouraging words. Um, will the Minister now, can the Minister now give me an assurance of some kind that we now need to revisit? the present plan at the have for tourism for the Antrim Coast Road and uh, to uh, now take it to its tourist potential and have the relevant finances there to do that and to put the, coast road, the Antrim Coast Road up there with the, with the uh, successes we have with the Titanic Quarter, etc. This is something that has been called for by the tourist providers in this area for years. I am one of them with 25 years experience in the tourist trade and we've never had publicity like this before. We must act on it to, 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 to get the legacy out of what we've had. Again, and uh, there has been a significant investment uh, along the North Antrim coast when we come to uh, the Giants Causeway, uh, and that facility is uh, attracting a very significant number of people, and I think the, the last figures that I saw uh, indicated that about 70 per cent of those who go to the Giants uh, Causeway uh, are visitors from outside Northern Ireland. Uh, yes, he, he draws attention to a very significant asset that we have for the tourist industry. While he has made his uh, remarks by way of a question to me, I am sure they have been heard by the Tourist Minister, uh, Arlene Foster, who is in uh, her, her place, uh, and I have no doubt that uh, she will want to, to use the, the best of the assets that we have in Northern Ireland to attract people to, to come to this province. Question yeah. number five has been withdrawn. George Robinson. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the First Minister what steps are being taken <coughs> to avoid the loss of millions of pounds as a result of Sinn Féin blocking the welfare reform bill? Yeah. Well, it is necessary in our executive to be getting a sufficient consensus which requires a majority of representatives from both sections of our community. At the last executive meeting, it's already been published that I asked for independent experts to be brought in to give us a set of figures as to what the implications are that uh, we would have uh, a resource at least where we're not arguing uh, about the, the figures. Uh, but uh, I've also asked for us to take a complete meeting of the executive to deal with that issue. So we're ready to, to talk, we're ready to discuss, we're ready to move forward with the, the issue, uh, and I trust that executive colleagues will be as well. Yeah. Order members, that includes questions uh, to the First Minister.